Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes to trickle in and we'll get started in just a few. All right, well, welcome everybody to today's webinar, Stories from the Field, Volunteer Management at Queen's Memory Project. I just have a few housekeeping notes to mention before we get going. If you have any sound or technical issues today, please let us know in the chat box with a direct message to me or to just call or email the number that you see here if you have it written down. This webinar is being recorded and the recording along with the PDF version of the slideshow will be sent out to you all sometime next week. And finally, we do have some built-in time at the end to answer any questions that may come up throughout the webinar, um, but please feel free to type them into the chat at any point and we'll be keeping track of them. Now, before we get started, I do just wanna share a little bit about the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program. DIPSNY, as we lovingly call it, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions such as archives, libraries, historical societies, museums, and other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and library research materials. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation surveys, condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs such as this webinar. To learn more about our services, you can visit our website at dhpsny.org. And with that, I'm going to pass it along to today's presenter, Meryl Agish, the Community Coordinator of the Queen's Memory Project. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you to Dipsney for inviting us. Um, for those of you who were able to check out Natalie um, Milbrode's presentation a couple of weeks back, uh, she's the director and founder of Queen's Memory and her Dipsney webinar was all about um, 11 years of the program, 11, 12, I think we're approaching 12. I lost track now, uh, but um, she goes through sort of a bird's eye picture. And then my presentation today, um, as you all know, will be about volunteer management um, and the way that we have adapted to all kinds of different changing circumstances. Um, I joined Queen's Memory in December 2019. So almost all of my time with the program has been in the pandemic and it as I'll discuss has been very, very different than all the years prior to that point. Um, so I will just give a little intro. Queen's Memory is a community archiving program that is co-administered by Queen's Public Library and Queen's College CUNY. Uh, it was founded as part of a, a thesis project that Natalie started when she was in library school at Queen's College and has now grown to a you know, really thriving program, if I can say, you know, say so myself. Um, we have, I think we're approaching a thousand oral history interviews in the collection, many of them recorded with the help of volunteers and other collaborators. And uh, we're a small team, but we have been able to really 
boost our work at the library and throughout the borough of Queens by working really closely with collaborators. I think of volunteers as collaborators in a lot of different ways, and I'll touch on some of those facets momentarily. Um, but when I joined the library, December 2019, as I mentioned, this picture is kind of what I imagined my library life to be like. This was um, the Lunar New Year Festival and parade in downtown Flushing in January 2020, kind of, you know, some weeks before we knew that things were suddenly going to change um, to a very unrecognizable day to day. But this is my husband, my daughter, my dad in the back peeking behind. Um, I am first generation, as I mentioned here, my parents are both immigrants, um, moved to Queens and stayed here uh, when they first arrived in the 50s, no, 60s and 70s. Um, I was born and raised in Queens. I'm raising my own daughter in Queens now. I have been a Queens Public Library card holder for as long as I can remember. And um, before I joined the library, I was working with a nonprofit documentary news production company called Retro Report. Um, so very different from what I do now, but there was that kind of connecting thread of working with archival material, doing deep, deep dive into research, interviewing people in really lengthy ways. But all of that was undergirded by about 15 years of oral history experience that um, I started in kind of as a hobby after college. I was a kind of typical liberal arts major. I majored in literature and art history, worked in different cultural nonprofits, and eventually found my way to journalism with the help of journalism school at CUNY and um, was approaching a point in my professional life where I wanted to just try something different. And Queen's Memory had created a new role of community coordinator. And I, when I was interviewing in the fall of 2019, this role was really set to kind of recreate the scene that we see here in this photo, um, Joanne Wong, who was a librarian at the Rosedale branch at this time, she was kind of the, the type of librarian model that we had in mind for the Queen's Memory Ambassadors program. So working closely with colleagues in our branches, we have 65 plus branches at Queen's Public Library, working closely with our colleagues, training um, them in oral history, interviewing, gathering, different reporting techniques, archiving techniques that Queen's Memory has developed over the decade of its existence. And that way we would be able to start um, working really closely with these 10 sites that are anchored by particular staff members who wanted to you know, spend time working with Queen's Memory techniques in their branches, kind of working with their community connections, the people that they you know, meet in their day-to-day -day lives, working in their different community locations. Um, so when I joined, it was to think through what would that process look like? What does that program look like? What are the training elements? What are the, the working relationships that we would have with our colleagues? And, um, you know, mid-December, that's what I started really thinking about. Um, needless to say, very soon, <laughs> things changed. Um, but at least in the early part of 2020, as I was getting oriented myself in Queen's memory techniques, I was getting familiar with some of the practices that were in place. So some of the established ways that volunteers had worked with Queen's memory was um, really focused on interviewing and story sharing. So we have had volunteer interviewers from I think the outset of Queen's memory who were getting trained in oral history interviewing, you know, having these really friendly, approachable, um, introductions to oral history where you could feel, you know, a little bit, you had a roadmap to follow. We, in January, February, even March of 2020, had done a couple of, you know, Natalie was leading those sessions. I was kind of apprenticing, seeing how they, they went, uh, putting my own approaches to them. And partnering with the Bayside Historical Society, for instance. Here, this is a local pottery studio that's actually down the street from my apartment in Kew Gardens. Uh, this was a week before the citywide lockdown. Um, 
where the local civic so association had wanted to gather people to share stories about this neighborhood. There are some residents who have participated who've been in the neighborhood for decades. Um, so this is the type of work that we were doing. It was very much in person, uh, finding ways for people to gather, to share stories, to listen to each other, and to find ways to record each other's stories. Um, as I mentioned, we were really thinking about the ambassadors program, working on this in-house training program, finding volunteers through those 10 sites, but also thinking about the broader work that we were doing with these different community partners. And obviously March, 2020, um, our plans started to slowly shift in the early weeks leading up to the lockdown. And then of course, everything stopped. Everything was unrecognizable in all parts of life uh, for many of us. And at this time when Queens, where we are located, was the epicenter of the epicenter of the global pandemic, there was no alternative to uh, leaving our apartments at this time for the folks who are working at the library. Um, I include this slide here. This is one of the first interviews that I recorded um, just to give a sense of this, you know, this lovely pottery studio. We're gathering, we're sitting so close together. This is March 14th. I, I'm blanking on the date, but it's, you know, just days before the lockdown. And this is a few weeks later. Um, when I was able to interview an ICU nurse who was traveling here from Arizona to help with the, the emergency efforts in Queens. Um, this was actually Tatum's first day off after being on rotation, basically from the moment of her plane touching down. Um, and she was able to share what it was like being in the, one of the local hospitals when um, it was extremely frightening um, to, to be here just sitting in my apartment, but you know, unimaginable what, what she and others were seeing in the hospitals. Um, so prior to this moment where everything changed, everything had been in person. It was really about being in community with people, with our volunteers, with our colleagues, with the you know, different community partners, and then everything halts. Um, we spent a week in kind of panic mode, um, just trying to figure out for ourselves, not as library workers, just as human beings, what's going on? How can we stay safe? What can we do to protect each other and ourselves? Um, and one of the ways that I was able to you know, maintain some level of sanity was through this work, connecting with people who I had supposed to, I was supposed to be meeting with them in person um, if things had not gone the way that they did. Um, talking with local, community contacts, many of whom I had not met prior to that point, but we would spend, you know, different um, meeting in Zoom rooms, meeting on the phone, meeting over email, you know, whatever meeting format was possible then to just check in with each other and to see, you know, we're living in this time that is very, we were very aware of this being a historically unprecedented time globally, but specifically in our borough. And how do we as an archive for the people of Queens, um, what do we do at this time when we are existing to be a place where people can record and share their history of their time in this borough? So we launched our COVID-19 project and I believe Natalie gets into this in much greater detail in her session. So please check that out if you haven't yet. But this was one way that we figured out, well, what purpose do we serve um, for our neighbors, our wider community um, as an archiving program, as a community focused archiving program um, that really tries to invite people in to participate in the archive however they can. So the public was invited to be part of the archive as contributors. All of these dots that you see um, are different submissions that people sent our way. So I was thinking about you know the public in kind of different levels of engagement. So the contributors, some of whom sent in one story and that may have been the beginning and end of their contact with Queen's Memory and the COVID-19 project. So that's one level of engagement with potential volunteers. And then working our way up, we also had an ongoing oral history training and recording uh, effort that was running alongside this archiving um, 
you know, sort of crowdsourced uh, real-time archive that we were building for people to have a place to share what they were going through in their day-to-day. -day. We really, if you have some time to explore this map, it runs the gamut from people like Tatum, who I mentioned earlier, you know, people who are working in the ICUs, working in different medical settings, sharing what they were seeing um, in those acute weeks and months. And then it comes, oh, the sound is gone. Hmm. Um, Okay, uh, and then building up to different levels of engagement where people were volunteering to be interviewed or volunteering to be interviewers, many of whom had never heard about Queen's memory prior to this point. So we were thinking about, and I was thinking about, um, how do we invite people in and how do we keep them engaged to the level that they wanna stay engaged? There were some people, as I mentioned, they would send in a story, a photo, um, Kind of sharing what their pandemic experience has been like and others who have stayed on as longer term volunteer interviewers as collaborators in different forms so it really was this experiment in adapting um, almost week by week to think about how do we as a community oriented program think about our community engage with community when it really is impossible to gather and to really be in community with people in any way that would be reminiscent of what we had done, you know, even just days and weeks before this point. So one of the things that was tremendously helpful, and I think this is something that many programs could use, um, is thinking about how do you reach the people that you would want to invite to your work. Um, we had kind of a double challenge where there were many people in Queens, there are many people in Queens, a borough of 2.3, 2.4 million people who do not know about Queens memory and the work that we do at the library and at Queens College. But I would guess Queens Public Library has very high recognition um, in our borough as just one of these um, very well dispersed institutions that serve all kinds of purposes for people you know, at every stage of their life. So we were thinking about how do we get the word out that we exist and the extra layer of challenges that we're launching this totally new project and inviting people to come and be part of an archive that may, they may not have even known existed before scrolling Instagram, for instance, and seeing one of these slides. So up to um, this big shift in the spring of 2020, Social media had been a part of Queen's Memories work, but it wasn't a primary focus. Um, it was something that you know, was updated pretty regularly, but wasn't a, a communication tool or an engagement tool. And when it came time to really get the word out about the work that we were doing, it became the central place that we could get the word out. And that included not just sharing submissions that had come our way, if you scroll through um, any of our social media channels, but especially our Instagram page, if you scroll all the way back to April 2020, when we first launched our account, you'll see people's submissions um, that had been shared with the archive, or perhaps they had tagged us on social media that we were sharing to show, you know, these are the types of stories that are coming to us. These are the types of records that we are compiling. Please share your story if you feel comfortable. Um, and we had outreach materials, primarily in Mandarin, English, and Spanish, but we also had submission forms available, I think in a dozen languages total. So we were thinking about who are the people who may be encountering our work and how do we make sure that we welcome them as well as we can when it's a web form. I know it's very different from somebody welcoming you to, a, um, to an interview space where you're sitting side by side or a workshop space, but we were trying to just be as accessible as possible. And to think about authentic messages that we were conveying on social media, that we were sharing people's stories and just thanking them for being part of the archive, inviting people to be part of the archive and also showing if somebody sent us a message, we were getting back to them really quickly. I was reaching out to people to invite them to be part of Queen's Memory, to find out more about the different opportunities that we were creating at a time when I think people were, were really looking for ways to connect 
um, because it was so difficult to do that. Um, I know now we're so used to being in Zoom, I don't, it was really, you know, a totally new landscape for us in the work that we did to translate um, this community-based approach to this very socially distanced remote setting. So social media has been a tremendous tool to get the word out for invitation purposes, for connecting purposes, for um, engagement, all kinds of different tools. And um, it has continued to be, especially Instagram, one of the primary ways that we get the word out and share the work that we do out into the broader community and keep inviting people, you know, please be part of our work, join a workshop, listen to our podcast, whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, we just want to make sure that we have this space really well covered. And one of the other you know, big linchpins of our work is these training sessions that we do. As I mentioned, we were doing them in person up to a week before our lockdown. And even that week of lockdown, I had an oral history workshop that I had planned to do, which up until I think a day or two before um, uh, things really started to take a turn locally, my colleagues in the branches were saying, yes, I think we can still keep doing it. And then, you know, obviously then it got canceled when everything shifted, but we were thinking about if we're inviting people to be oral history interviewers, that's a whole new practice to many people. Um, we had some people who had journalism backgrounds, some oral history backgrounds even, but by and large, the wider public, you know, oral history may be the first time that they're encountering um, this form of interviewing. You know, perhaps they hadn't heard about what is oral history, how do I even do an oral history interview, it can be very um, hard to navigate this kind of volunteer experience. So by keeping the barriers as low as we could, you know, I was on the phone. I, I've lost track, but I think in that first half year of being in this remote world, I must have talked to a couple hundred people many of whom I never heard from again, but to get the word out about oral history, to get them started so that they felt comfortable when the time came for them to record an interview, that they had the training as quick as it may have been to feel comfortable recording on Zoom or on the phone, um, thinking about the different forms that we need. And um, I'll get to those links in a moment, but really thinking about what materials do we need to make sure people have in hand so that they can feel a part of the work and have a guide when, you know, maybe it was a phone call where we walked through a screen share together or it was a small Zoom setting where I was doing um, kind of informal trainings as people were coming my way. And eventually this became a regular training series where it was clear we could not wait and put the, a hold on our oral history interviewing and uh, training until circumstances change because two years later, more than two years later now, circumstances are still very difficult and um, our trainings still remain primarily online because this is a way for people to connect. Um, and we have really honed this approach, figuring out what are the ways that work? What are the blind spots that we had going into virtual um, workshops, which over the last two years plus, we have really honed over time. And I'll get to a link at the very end, but I invite anyone who's here who would like to join one of our trainings, you do not need to be a Queens resident, have any connection to Queens. I still do these monthly trainings um, for volunteers, new volunteers who wanna learn about Queens memory and also oral history uh, interviewing. So those are open, I have them every month. And um, again, they're open to anyone who would like to join. Queen's connection is a plus, but not a requirement at all. And by the time fall 2020 came around, uh, we had completely rethought our ambassadors program, that in-person 10 librarian training program that I had been hired just, you know, eight, nine months before to really shape, craft, and lead, we decided, let's try this. Because our staff at that time, they had returned to on-site work in the branches, but as part of rotating teams. So there was that built-in remote work that was part of their regular schedules. A lot of them were feeling very distanced 
um, obviously in more ways than one, but that engagement that you get from seeing people regularly, seeing your neighbors, seeing community members come through the branch. And a lot of those folks were not coming through. Um, you know, a lot of people were reluctant to spend a lot of time in the branches. A lot of our staff also was very concerned about contact. So it wasn't the what life was like before the pandemic in terms of their library work as well. So this training program that we crafted was a way for them to get some of that community connection, to think about who are the people who I miss seeing. This was a chance for some of our librarian colleagues to invite people who they knew as regulars, perhaps they were part of a friends group of their branch, or they were you know, an engaged community member that they would see pretty often, or perhaps a former um, high school student who was working as a page and now has since moved on. The, this program provided a way for them to get some training in oral history collecting and thinking about how do I invite people to participate in an interview? Um, how do I explain what Queen's memory is? the work that we do, what is a community archive, what is oral history, and we had regular training sessions through the fall and winter um, 2020, 2021, where it was very different in practice than what we had envisioned when I first came to the team December 2019, but it was really successful because it gave people a way to connect, and um, in some cases our volunteers who had come through as volunteers, uh, volunteer interviewers through our COVID-19 project, they were able to be matched with um, some of our librarian colleagues to help out with recording interviews, um, working out logistics, working with photographs in some cases where they were recording what the local landscape was like um, around the different locations that were participating in the ambassadors program. So our colleague training really extended from our volunteer training and thinking about if we can't gather as we used to, and we see that there's such a deep interest, I can't even explain, there was such a tremendous interest in this particular part of the work, that oral history collecting, that we needed to find ways to meet people's needs. And um, it's one of the highlights of my time so far is just seeing how oral history fit a specific need during this really, um, and it continues to be a very hard time for people to connect, to listen, to share what they have been going through, and um, to know that it is now that interview recording being treated with the same care that our colleagues in the physical archives at the library treat, you know, those traditional physical archival materials that the, you know, perhaps somebody walking down the street when they think of archive, that's what they think of, but our digital archive is treating these interviews with that same level of care. Um, and it gave this whole project and this whole shift to trying things out virtually, you know, that extra layer of gravitas um, that these interviews would be stored somewhere and would be used for future researchers, for memorial purposes in some cases, for all kinds of um, short and long-term potential uses. So the guides that I mentioned uh, we have a resources page on our website. When you get these slides, it's linked right here, and we have all kinds of documents, but the ones that particularly helped us through this remote time um, was a way for us to get down on paper. What are the steps in 10 or so steps to do an oral history interview for Queen's Memory? And I would always tell people you can adapt this for your own purposes. You can use it for a family project or an academic project, which I know some of our volunteers ended up doing, um, but this is a roadmap that you can follow. And we would walk through in these 10 or so steps from pre-interview to post-interview processing, what are the different, what's the roadmap that you can follow so that it feels a little less overwhelming. And over time, we were really refining, we were honing this, it has changed so much in the last two plus years uh, as our practices have changed, as our processing team has adapted to some different, um, you know, they've changed some of the workflow and by having it be a living document, not just to suit volunteer needs, but to suit our needs on the internal processing side um, that whenever there's a new person coming our way, 
uh, or perhaps an established volunteer, they have the latest packet to walk them through so that they know, okay, I can follow these steps. Maybe it's the same as last time, maybe there's a new link, but it's all um, contained in this one packet. And our transcription guide, I, I'm talking a lot about our interviewers, uh, but we also have volunteers who work on editing transcripts. And this was also adapted to new platforms that we were using that we were then able to share resources with volunteers who are working, you know, they were not coming to the library to sit alongside uh, one of our colleagues to edit transcripts in person. That unfortunately has not been possible. So the accessibility question is always a stress point. Um, but thinking about for people who do have access to a computer at home, and this is something that they would like to do, uh, on their own time, we have a transcription guide that walks through that process as well. Um, since interviews, as I mentioned, are so central to the work that we do, and we wanted to make sure that people who were perhaps totally new to interviewing or totally new to transcription editing, that they had these guides that would really walk them through. And if they had questions at any point, we were always, you know, we are always here. I always emphasize this is my job to work with people who are doing this. Uh, who are helping us in our work and it is our responsibility too to help them in the work that they do whether or not it comes to queen's memory that is not always um, a direct line but i think there's a lot about how can you help the people who help you that has been a guiding principle for me through this time and thinking about all the different ways that um, that help can come so I'm using this image again because in two plus years of pandemic uh, <laughs> programming, I do not have great images for some of my uh, points. But again, this point of the colleagues as collaborators that we launched our fully remote training series using what we learned from a couple of months of doing our COVID-19 project and adapting our oral history collecting, our volunteer relationships to very different circumstances. And as I mentioned, some of our volunteers who had come through you know, our COVID-19 general project were then able to be paired perhaps with their local library staff to record interviews. So again, it was a way of thinking, how can we connect people? How can we help people do the work that they would like to do? Um, because it, for anyone who's done oral history work before, and I think this extends to so much of the work that we all do in archives and libraries. It is so time intensive. It is so um, deep focus intensive. And sometimes it just, if somebody can step in and help you out, it makes all the difference. So um, this is a model that we will continue in the future. Um, and again, it's so different from what we had planned, but it really showed thinking critically about what would work in very different circumstances has really helped us connect with our colleagues in the branches as well, um, because they're doing work that's very different than the work that we do, but there are so many nexus points where we can help each other out. So partnering with volunteers, this is, um, as I was just saying, something that has been such a vital way for us to deepen our connections with volunteers and think about if you're helping me, how can I help you? Sometimes that may be as simple as, let me set up a Zoom uh, session for you and your interviewee because I you told me that your computer's memory is totally full and you're really scared about losing a recording if the file suddenly disappears. So let me help you, I'll set up a session I'll just be there to press record. You don't have to worry about it. It can be as simple as that. But in other cases, it's really about helping people out, um, sometimes in ways that you don't expect. So Oscar Zamora Flores on the top, he is currently um, working towards his um, MLIS degree at Queens College. But when he first met me um, online in uh, late 2020, he was a recent undergrad uh, graduate in linguistics. He wasn't really sure what his path would be, but he had this interest in oral history. He wasn't really sure how to get a foothold in it. And somebody through a conversation told him about our work. And then Oscar was able to get some training uh, through one of my sessions and really connect with people who he wanted to record with. So Oscar is a 
a lifelong resident of Jackson Heights. And uh, that is one of the neighborhoods that has been really central in the local mutual aid movement. And um, all kinds of different groups have emerged to help out with all kinds of really um, pressing needs to meet what was emerging for the local community. And Oscar as a native Spanish speaker as well was able to think about, you know, who are the stories that are, whose stories are not being recorded in perhaps our mainstream media outlets or in other uh, kinds of settings. And he reached out to different people he was meeting through these mutual aid networks, especially um, people of color who were working in LGBTQ plus led initiatives and over time, he realized this is something I want to do with my life. And now Oscar is pursuing graduate work and developing this project that really started as um, something that he was just thinking about, you know, that kernel of an idea that now his interviews are housed with Queen's memory. He has this forward looking path that incorporates Queen's memory work into his career trajectory. And he and I have um, been part of a couple of sessions, you know we've invited him to present alongside us at different professional conferences, which you know, he's able to speak about his experience, not just as a volunteer, but as an emerging professional in this field. And we are really helped by getting his perspective on the work that he does and his lens on how oral history has helped him connect with his community in these different ways. And uh, Bridget Bartolini on the lower side here, um, she is a longtime friend and collaborator of Queen's Memory. She predates my involvement in this work, um, but she launched in the pandemic her 34th Avenue Oral History Project, where she also is a resident of Jackson Heights and was recording with people who um, have started to adapt to this open street that extends about 40 blocks in Jackson Heights. And some of her potential interviewees are most comfortable speaking in Spanish. She reached out to me because she needed somebody to help. And she had some grant funding to help support that work and to pay that person for their work. And I immediately thought of Oscar, not just because he is you know, an active volunteer, he is a Spanish speaker, he's also a Jackson Heights resident. And that able, the ability to kind of connect people who perhaps they would have met as neighbors um, in their, you know, in their neighborhood or in, in this oral history community, which is rather small and intimate, but they hadn't encountered each other before. And so now Oscar was able to use that training that he got with us and get paid for the work and to deepen his own work in his neighborhood and um, to just add another layer to the work that he's doing. So, you know, I amplify this point on the bottom here that Find, finding ways to be supportive, to be available, to be interested in the people who are helping you can help make these connections happen. Because I'm in touch with a lot of our volunteers, um, I, in one case, even wrote a graduate uh, school recommendation letter for a volunteer who, through her work with Queen's Memory, wanted to make a shift to community archiving um, after years of being an art therapist. So it's about how can I support you um, since you are also supporting me in the work that we do. And when it comes also to supporting the work of others. So after that initial rush in 2020, which lasted for many months, but we had so many people coming our way who wanted to record interviews, who wanted to learn more about oral history, wanted to be part of the archiving effort. Um, over time, you know, as the pandemic has kept going and going and people's availability changed, people's energy levels changed, you know, life continued even as the pandemic continued. And that um, period early on where we really had very limited options eventually has opened up in different ways, of course. And I've seen, and we've seen as a program volunteer interests change in different ways. Some people have stayed on and deepened their practice and others, perhaps they recorded an interview, perhaps a couple of interviews, and then their availability changed. That happens in all kinds of volunteer settings, but um, we've also been thinking about, well, how can we as a program support the work of others that's already ongoing? You know, thinking about somebody like Oscar where 
his entry into Queen's memory re really helped lay the next steps of his professional and educational path, there are others who are doing work that's in alignment with Queen's memory, who once we connect with them, we can help support them in different ways. So Linda Gangian, whose um, postcard is on the top here, she is a local artist and she was part of a community engaged um, artistic exhibition that was taking place in Jamaica, close to where I work uh, at the Central Branch. And she, prior to this point, had been doing a lot of interviewing informed uh, part of her artistic practice. And she had that oral history background, that interviewing background. And then we connected through you know, a couple of chance um, connections. Uh, she decided, I would really like to just get a little bit more rooted in Queen's Memories work um, to follow those practices because it gave her some guidelines to follow. It really helps to have you know, the legal consent in place, a preservation partner in place um, for somebody like her who is recording these long interviews that then she incorporates in her artwork. And we were able to be her preservation partner for this project. And the work that she's doing is so close in spirit to the work that we do where she was highlighting different locations around the Jamaica neighborhood and pairing them with remembrances. Um, some that were pulling from interviews that were already in the Queen's Memory Archive and others that she was recording herself. And um, she ended up producing a series of these postcards and uh, there was a display case for a couple months uh, last year. And every time I would go through the lobby, I would see these postcards would just go because they were so connected to the neighborhood. People re recognize these different places. Uh, this is a parking lot that is now being paved over to be a big condo building. And I love that she was able to capture it before um, it is now being used for very different purposes. Um, but those interviews are now part of our archive. And Unit 25, the architectural collage that's on the bottom, they are an architectural seminar, a grad level seminar that runs out of City College in Upper Manhattan. So, you know, no direct Queens connection, except that this seminar is really focusing on being in different communities, interviewing people so that it can be part of their design process as part of this year long seminar. And many of those interviews where some of the students have been recording with um, undocumented street vendors in the Corona neighborhood, other uh, people who work in sort of informal labor networks. Um, this last year, they have been interviewing around environmental issues in the Far Rockaway neighborhood. Um, those interviews, some are just used for their educational purposes, for their research purposes, and um, they don't eventually get deposited with Queen's memory, but some of them have. And one of the uh, students, Pedro Cruz Cruz, who really connected with the interviewing approach, and now he just graduated yesterday, congratulations to Pedro. Um, he has said that interviewing has become so central to his thinking as an architect and designer that he can't imagine not using that as he moves forward in his career. And so connecting with people like Pedro and other students through this architectural seminar where we were there to provide interviewing basics, just a basic level of training. And then that relationship has continued over two academic years. And in some cases it's become in, in, you know, independent of that relationship, uh, volunteer kind of continued uh, relationship and Pedro has also presented at some professional conferences with us as have Oscar and Bridget. And we're looking forward to being all together, fingers crossed in LA for the Oral History Association uh, conference that's coming up to talk about the work that they're all doing where Queen's memory can be a kind of container and connector to support the work that people are doing in the community that ties back to the mission of our work. Um, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> so, as our relationships with volunteers have changed, you know, thinking about artistic partners, architectural partners, creative partners, all these different collaborations, at the heart of our work is still keeping that open door for people who may think, as uh, Alice did, I just really want to interview my grandma. So Alice joined one of our orientations. She knew that she wanted to learn more about the work that we do and learn more about oral history. She got some of that training. And then the next day, 
because we were able to share resources, she's one of those folks um, who her computer just would not be able to handle a Zoom recording. So we were able to help her out with the video uh, recording session so that she could use that training that she got from Queen's Memory just a week or two before and sit down with her grandma and finally record that interview that she had been planning to do for a very long time. And so by keeping these kind of more traditional doors open as well, where we have those trainings, they run every month, it's a regular schedule, perhaps it will change as our circumstances change for right now, we're keeping them online. Um, so that people who are potentially interested in being a part of Queen's Memory, perhaps as a longer term volunteer, or perhaps as a one off um, interview that they would like to record and just need a little boost or a little push to, to get them to do that recording that we're here thinking about, well, how do we provide these different services for people who want to connect with us? So again, the theme of this presentation in some ways has been how do you keep adapting and readapting and changing um, the way that you think about your network and think about your relationships, perhaps with individual volunteers or with volunteers as a more general um, group who can help you with your work. You know, this is just such an extraordinary time. And these are such, when you think about it, the circumstances that we've all been living through um, has really helped us rethink the work that we do. And I think revive some of the ways that we can be in community in ways that are very new to Queen's memory still. And um, here, this is Sarah Hennig at our Peninsula branch interviewing some of the members of the longtime knitting group that's been meeting at their branch. Sarah is part of our kind of 2.0 of our Queen's Memory Ambassadors program. So here we see, you know, there's some adapting that continues. Um, the knitting group had not been able to meet in person for two years. Sarah wanted to invite them before they were able to come back to just share their story about how the group started, um, when they felt comfortable being back in person again. Um, and she was able to share the happy news that they were able to now reconvene in person. So we have a these group of interviews about how the knitting group started a decade ago plus and thinking about how they maintain their connections through the pandemic and what they're looking forward to. So there is that return to in-person with some adaptation. Um, and we just keep kind of toggling between different comfort levels, thinking about what works, what can be changed, what can be um, improved in different ways. And there is no set roadmap that I can share with you all, but I hope that um, through some of these <laughs> lessons that we've learned, um, that it may help you in the work that you all are doing and thinking about those volunteer relationships, those collaborator relationships. So here, my last slide, um, as I mentioned a couple of times, we have these regular workshops and volunteer orientations. Um, we have them posted on our events calendar. And if they aren't, please get in touch with me. I can share the links with you directly. I think um, there just may be an item on my to-do list that I need to cross off. But if you check out that calendar and you don't see the link, um, please get in touch. I'm happy to share those with you directly. And so um, thank you all for following along on this very meandering in some ways journey of volunteer management and thinking about our collaborations <clears throat> in our community work. Um, and I'll, I'll pause now in case there are any questions. No, oh, thank you for your comment. Thank you, Karine, that's very nice. And um, just putting it in the chat now, this is our events calendar. <clears throat> and I'm seeing that um, actually we do not have our next training sessions, but 
please get in touch with me if you'd like to sign up. I believe the um, we have uh, it's in the next two weeks our orientation and oral history workshop. And if you can't join in June, um, we'll have them in July, August, and for the foreseeable future, convening online. Thanks so much, Meryl. I um, have gone ahead and reshared the links in the chat, and I have also shared a link to our evaluation form. If you, those of you attending could take a moment to complete that, we'd greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, we'll also be sharing that link when we send out a follow-up email with the recording. But it looks like we do have a few more minutes if anyone has any questions or comments they'd like to submit. All right, well, it seems like we have um, folks are trickling out. So I just want to take another moment to thank Merle for sharing so much about Queen's Memory Project and especially everything that's been happening over the last two years. I, I hope you all found it as insightful as I have. Oh, we have a question. <laughs> so the question is, what do you do when you, when you <clears throat> excuse me, when you encounter a situation where a potential participant is resistant to be interviewed. So this happens quite regularly. Sometimes people will say, I have had a very unremarkable life. Why would you even want to talk to me? Um, and other times people are reluctant to share for you know various personal reasons as well. Um, so yeah, when somebody does not want to sign a waiver, I think we lead with that invitation of, I, I always emphasize nobody has led a life exactly like yours. You are an expert in your story and I would really love to hear you share it, however much you would like to share. Um, it doesn't always change people's minds, but really focusing on, you know, nobody else will be able to tell your story in exactly the way that you can. And sometimes people will just be reluctant. Um, in some cases we've had people be really worried about sharing too much personal information. So to the degree that we can, uh, we can offer some anonymity, we can offer some um, redacting from the transcript, but there are limits to that too. Um, I know that much bigger oral history programs, they can do all kinds of embargoes. They just have the capacity to do a lot more um, of that security and privacy precaution work. Um, if somebody is reluctant to sign a waiver, then there's only so much, unfortunately, that we can do. If somebody would like to share the, you know, in some cases, people will say, I'm happy to be interviewed. I'm happy to share my story with you, but I do not want it archived for the public. And in that case, somebody who's following our kind of volunteer approach, they can follow that roadmap. But then when it comes time to deposit the file with us, that step doesn't happen. Or in some cases, they will have sent the file, you know, submitted it for archiving, and then the, the interviewee will say, actually, I don't want this archived. That will always go with whatever um, the interviewee and interviewer want. So if there is a conflict, if somebody wants the interview pulled, then we'll go with that. Um, and in some cases, people will simply be reluctant and we try our best to really lead with like the personal interest, the value of their sharing their story, perhaps even for personal sharing among their family or their friends. And if somebody just isn't interested in the moment, maybe try them again in a couple months time. There's no thing that always works, but I think really emphasizing that your interest and in why you wanna hear their story, why you would wanna record, that sometimes can ease people's nerves and anxiety. <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going. Um, do you ever, thank you, I, I hope that helped Ariana. Uh, Patricia asks, do you ever obtain additional materials to archive along with the oral history? So diaries, photos, folk art, etc. So we are a digital archive um, and that 
kind of puts some limits on what we're able to gather as part of the interview package, but we do have people who have photos. In some cases, they already have them digitized and scanned. In other cases, they come to us um, and we can help them with that digitization. So if they would like to share family snapshots, um, family records in some cases, absolutely, we're able to add those digitized files along with the oral history recording. Um, our colleagues in the physical archives would handle any of those requests for um, depositing physical materials with them, um, but they have different collecting interests, different um, practices in place. So we're able to take as much as we can digitally, um, but for anything, if somebody wants to share a diary or an artwork, unfortunately at Queen's memory, memory we're not able to take that physical item, um, but we try our best to digitize whatever we can. So if somebody would like to share an artwork, uh, many pages of a diary, we're able to do that and can work with people to, to do that digitization. Great. Well, thank you for all of these questions. We have another minute or two if there's anything else anyone would like to ask. All right, so we seem to be having a few more trickle out. So I think we will call it a day. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Meryl, and with Dipsney. And for those of you who attended, we will be sharing the recording next week with you, as well as the PDF and another link to the evaluation. Uh, thank you again for attending today and be in contact with any questions you have. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you so much, everybody.